Welcome to the 10th Annual Young Playwrights Festival at the City Opera House in Traverse City, Michigan. I'm Doug Stanton, one of the co-founders of the National Writer Series, and we're here in our mutual home today. Uh, and the Opera House and the Playwrights Festival has asked us to say a few words in support of this amazing institution in our community. The Young Playwrights Festival allows young authors, young playwrights to see their work performed on stage to meet with professional writers and to be treated as young artists seriously um, in the craft of writing. I can't say enough about this program and I know that it's touched many lives in our community. I want to say thank you, um, as does the Playwrights Festival to the Michigan State University Federal Credit Union for their sponsorship of arts and education at the City Opera House here. And most of all, the six playwrights whom you'll meet uh, their mentors, their teachers in schools, and their parents, especially for their support. Yay to the parents. Thank you. Um, the mentors are, I want to mention them because they, uh, they deserve uh, um, acknowledgement for their own professional accomplishments and for coming to our community here and bringing that outside world to us. They are Michael Haney, freelance director, former associate artistic director, Cincinnati Playhouse in the Park, Franny Shepard Bates, Director, Detroit Public Theater, Thomas Cote, Artistic Director of the Workshop Theater, New York City, Eric Guild, Actor, Writer, Freelance, New York City, Seth Gordon, University of o Oklahoma, Head of the Helmrich School of Drama, and Burt Goldstein, Director of the Institute for Arts and Creativity at the Wharton Center at MSU, who's long been organizing and whose guiding spirit has made this program so popular. Um, thank you to the actors and directors, and especially to Minda Nyquist, who's the program coordinator. Now, the recent spikes in COVID um, uh, means that these six plays will be done in a staged reading presentation and will be available for viewing on the City Opera House's YouTube channel later. So until next time, until we meet here on this stage, please enjoy. Thank you. I'm April Klobis president and CEO at Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. MSUFCU is proud to be a sponsor and supporter of the Traverse City Opera House. I thought I might take just one moment and tell you a little bit about MSUFCU as we are new to your community. MSUFCU was founded in 1937 to support faculty, staff, students, and alumni at Michigan State University with low cost loans and high rate savings. We're proud to be a new member of the Traverse City community. We have a branch located on Union Street and a new branch coming up this summer on US 31. Everyone can find a way to become eligible to join MSU FCU, where we will help you achieve your financial dreams. Hello and welcome to the 10th annual Young Playwrights Festival here in beautiful Traverse City in the historical and glorious City Opera House. We're so happy that you can join us this year, even though it has come with challenges and things have been different. We have all been getting used to change and that's what we've done this year. We've had to pivot um, with our young playwrights, but we know how important it is to get our young students and their voices heard and so here we are with a blank stage, masks on, and six feet apart for protection for our staged readings of this year's six finalists. These finalists come from even downstate in Williamston, Kalkaska, Traverse City Central, Cal uh, Traverse City West, um, and Interlochen Arts Academy. And we couldn't be more thrilled with each of these finalists and how much work they've put into this with their professional mentors. Uh, we thank you for coming and joining us. We hope that you enjoy what we've done with our staged readings, and we look forward to another successful year of the Young Playwrights Festival. I'm Minda Nyquist, the Traverse City Coordinator, and welcome, thank you, and enjoy. Hello, this is Caleb Barker. I'm the author of Entries from a Life Lived Full for this year's Young Playwright Competition. Um, I'm really, really happy that I was able to have this opportunity to share my work with everybody. I'm glad that uh, everybody else liked it enough to bring it to the finals so it can be performed. Um, I'm very honored to be a part of this all, and I had a really fun time doing it, so there's that as well. 
Um, my inspiration for this story came through my liking for uh, more character-driven narratives, stories that focus on the characters and how they interact with the world around them rather than how those characters fit into a fictional world set up by the author. So I tried to make a more realistic story that um, really just focuses on, I guess, the psychology of this character, how he functions and what he does and the relationships he builds. Um, so I think I did a, a pretty good job with that, with what I was trying to do. Um, thanks. I want to thank uh, Professor Gordon, who was my mentor, for helping me edit this play and bring it to the place it is now because uh, it definitely had a lot of work to be done before it was ready to be performed, and he helped a lot, so I just wanted to give a big thanks to him um, for helping me share my work with you guys like this. Uh, I think it's really important for everybody, especially people of our age who are going through such this developmental time, shifting between uh, teenagers and becoming adults to share their voice like this, because we all have different views and opinions on different things, and we all interpret the world in different ways, and I think the only way we can really come closer together as people is through understanding how they see those things, and I think things such as music and art and literature are just some of the perfect mediums for us to express ourselves like that. Um, and so I'm really happy that not just me, but everybody else who was involved in this whole competition uh, was able to have the opportunity. I also wanted to give a big thanks to my teacher, uh, Mrs. Nolan, for allowing us to do this. It's been really fun, and I'm once again really glad to have this opportunity. So I hope you all enjoy it, um, and I will guess I will talk to you guys later, I believe. Hi, I'm Michelle Hopkins. I am the director of the Young Playwrights Festival piece by Caleb Barker called Entries from a Life Lived Full. Scene opens with a young man sitting at an uncomfortable looking desk in a grungy looking apartment, lit via a dim lamp. He finishes writing in a leather bound journal and takes a sip of coffee. The man stands up and begins to read from his journal as he paces around the room, looking out the window every now and again. September 17th, 2004. Today marks the third Wednesday since the move, and I can still feel myself aging with the passing minutes each and every day. Being so far away from any familiar landmark is unexplainably draining despite the fact that everything that used to make me feel that way resides back in my hometown. I, I spent my college years studying at a local community college that was just 20 minutes from my childhood home. After graduating, I knew that continuing to live there was just making me feel worse and worse. On the drive to work every weekday morning, I would pass too many memorials to first loves and late nights. Each sighting left me feeling so painfully nostalgic <laughs> that I thought I'd roll up my insides right on the spot. Each, <sighs> I needed some sort of escape, internal or external, so I moved. I collected my limited array of personal belongings and moved halfway across the country, as a matter of fact. I'm in Chicago now. And I don't have much to say about the place just yet, except that it's a change of pace. There's much, much more to do here. Uh, but the city sounds that drag late into the night leave me with these uh, terrible headaches. And I haven't been sleeping well. Laura says that it takes a lifetime to acclimate to the city. I, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it's a struggle to say the least. Laura is one of the only faces I can make out in the crowd these days, and I'm finding myself more and more grateful for her being here. Lights shift to Laura, a dark-haired woman wearing her hair in a bun with glasses and a tan sweater, standing alone next to the set for Neil's bedroom, but not in it. She stands there for a moment as Neil continues speaking, and she leaves shortly after. Laura is one of my cousins. The only one I can ever stand, honestly. And it's because of her that I came here. I had always dreamed of moving to Queens after a brief field trip in the fourth grade, but the thought of feeling as small 
as New York makes one feel without a single pillar of familiarity was much more than I could bear even thinking about, yet alone doing. And so I came here. Simple as that, nothing more to it. My time has been mostly uninteresting as of right now, but yesterday I, I did meet somebody on the blue line. Pause as the lights pan to a girl with shorter hair and a bright red coat in the same way they did for Laura. Brief pause in dialogue. A girl, actually. She kind of just walked up to me and started talking, and I didn't know what to make of it. Lights shift to another area of the stage, the inside of a train, in which a few people stand wearing all black with black masks. And the girl and Neil walk to the train sitting in different seats. The girl looks back at him a couple of times before finally approaching him, and they begin to converse. Hey there. Uh, hello. Uh, I know it's just a little bit odd to walk up to somebody like this, but we live in the same apartment complex. I saw you move in the other day. Oh. OK. Is that all you have to say? Even a simple hi would have done fine. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. This is my first time in a big city like this. I guess I'm just not used to this many people being around me. I just, I, I feel out of place. I'm sorry. Do you want to try one more time? Uh, yeah, I, I'd like that. Uh, how are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> like I said, I know it's a little odd, but I wanted to introduce myself. But I'll be honest, I forgot which apartment was exactly yours. So when I saw you here, I didn't want to miss the opportunity. <laughs> hey, uh, well, it's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. What are you doing this far away from home? Uh, job hunting, uh, at the moment. There's so many buildings and people, you'd think it would be a little easier to find a place to work, but I'm having a hard time with it. Mm, it's awful, trust me. I've lived here my whole life, and I've heard so many people say that, I've honestly lost count. It's uh, really starting to worry me. I have enough saved up to tide me over for a while, but the rent here is through the roof. Both stop talking for a moment. Neil looks down at his feet while the girl looks around the train. Hey, where'd you get that coffee from? The place near our complex really doesn't meet even my lowest of standards. Oh, it's from Cafe Umbria. It's just a couple blocks away from my office. Here, do you want to try it? <laughs> Are you sure? That seems a little bit... Oh, it's fine, it's fine. I don't have germs, I promise. <laughs> okay, if you're sure. <laughs> Jeez! Do you want any coffee with that? What's that supposed to mean exactly? This is pure sugar. Uh, How do you I drink this? What can I say? I know what I like. Everybody stops moving besides Neil. He begins walking back to his apartment as the lights shift once again narrating on the way. When he gets back, he sits down at a desk and continues reading. The conversation didn't go much longer than that, as her stop came shortly after and she had to leave. I did learn her name, though. Chelsea. I like that name. I really do like that name. I don't know what it is, but being around her feels so similar to being around my friends at home. It's just nice to have that familiarity when everything else here is anything but. I'm hoping to find time to check out that coffee shop tomorrow. Although I'll definitely be ordering something different than what Chelsea had. Scene ends. Neil is once again sitting in his apartment writing in his journal, but this time he is sitting at the kitchen table. He looks anxious, tapping his foot repeatedly. He stops for a brief moment to take an Advil with a sip from a cup of water. As he finishes, he once again stands up to read from it while pacing the room. October 3rd. I still don't know how my mom didn't realize what we were doing. Getting away with that is one of my greatest accomplishments to this day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we really did have some good times back then, didn't we? Oh, it's so great to be with you like this again. I haven't seen much of you since you went off to school. Just like those sleepovers back at Grandma's house. <laughs> Lights drop from Laura, 
and Neil stands up and faces the audience and begins narrating again. It's beginning to get cold in Chicago. At times, it's too much to bear. I'm not used to it, not in the slightest. Me and Laura went out to lunch together last week. It was nice. It was really nice. We talked for a long time about back home and of our late grandmother. Three days before our grandmother died, she began tearing out tufts of her hair in a frenzy, repeatedly and loudly lamenting her life spent without seeing Venice. I don't know if this was a result of her seemingly endless medication routine or her own loss of sanity as it all became too much to bear. Either way, it was quite the disturbing experience, and I had nightmares about it for a while. Here was this woman, this stern mother of my mother, who had spent a lifetime in, in, in countless endeavors, whether that was teaching, volunteering, traveling, and at the end of it the all, uh, she looked so painstakingly simple, painstakingly human. She died a week later. Neither of us have had the heart to talk about her death to each other, and yet those awful feelings are always there. Things like that seem to have a good way of lingering. Laura came over again today to help me get the last of my things in order, and we got takeout from a local burger place. We stayed up late and just talked and laughed, reminiscing on our childhood. It really did feel just like old times again. Neil sits back down at the table with Lara, and the lights come back up onto the two of them as they resume conversation. It's just great to have something familiar here. Everything else is so different. There's, there's so many people, and it's, it's so loud all the time. I felt the same way at first. You'll get used to it. <laughs> Trust me. I sure hope so. So, any luck looking for work? Not much. I've had a couple callbacks, but the interviews didn't go too well. You just need so much experience for even an entry-level job here. Oh, trust me, I get it. I was lucky enough that my professor knew some startups around here, and the one I applied for is doing well enough. I'm, I'm just nervous. In a couple of months here, I'll be all out of cash if I can't find somewhere soon. Uh, at, this, at that point, this whole thing will be nothing but a very expensive vacation. I'm sure it's gonna work out for you. Here, take a fry. <laughs> Not sure how much that helps, but thank you. Hey, cheer up. Ooh, ooh, tell me about that girl you mentioned. <laughs> I mean, what is there to say, really? We met on a train. Uh, she works as a journalist, and tell me, and, and trust me when I tell you she has terrible taste in coffee. <laughs> She's been showing me around the area a little bit. It's just nice to have a friend here. Ooh, I wonder if I would like her. I'm sure you would. She's fun. Just fun? Come on, you can do better than that. What makes this one person so interesting to you, Neil? I get that she's fun, but what's so great about her? Uh, I don't know, she just... She just has a way of pulling you from those slumps of monotony. Uh, no concept is simple to her. It's always worth a second thought, a, a third even. Uh, being with her just feels so uh, familiar, even if we just met. I went out the other night to try this new Italian restaurant, and, and she saw me on the street and just ran up to me, not even caring about how silly she looked doing it. Uh, we talked. And she walked me around the city for a while longer before she retired to her apartment. I, I never asked her what she was doing that night. But I'm glad she was there. She really does sound great. I'm, I'm glad you've made such a good friend, Neil. Me too. They continue eating their food as the curtains close. Scene ends. The curtains stay closed, and once again, Neil begins to narrate. December 5th, 2004. 
I haven't felt like myself recently. And I don't think I have since I left home. I, I had a strange sense of self before, one that I didn't necessarily like, but at least it was there. It was consistent. This idea has been crossing my mind more and more, and it's beginning to scare me. I've begun to feel terribly homesick. And the thought of moving back home has crossed my mind more than once. When it gets too hard to handle, I'll wander around late at night where the cityscape is there to deafen all of it. Last time this happened, I found myself at a party. Curtains open, revealing a Christmas-themed party. Holiday music plays in the background, and Neil walks over and sits at a table with two people dressed all in black with black masks covering their faces. And he continues reading from his journal as the people around him stand up to get drinks. Chelsea can be spotted sitting at one of the back tables, seemingly conversing with more people in all black with masks. I hesitate to use that word because the parties I knew from back home typically consisted of bottom shelf liquor, small talk, and strip poker. This was different. I hardly knew any of these people, but the entire congregation felt so welcoming. It smelled of nostalgia and peppermint. I've never understood the feeling of nostalgia. Sometimes it's there when it should be, sometimes it's there where it shouldn't be, and it feels comforting yet heart-wrenching all at the same time. It's taken me a while to write about this because the whole night had that same radiance. It was uh, warm, but overwhelming, comforting yet constricting. I, I don't know if I'll ever understand it. I spotted Chelsea among the other guests but she was so engrossed in her conversation with a group of people whose faces I couldn't quite make out that the thought of approaching her didn't cross my mind. Curtains closed. Instead, I found my way to the roof. There was so much noise in the house, I was starting to feel really uncomfortable and I needed some fresh air. The night sky was beautiful and the air was sweet. After a short while by myself, I looked over and saw Chelsea exiting the window and coming onto the roof. I hadn't noticed inside, but she had dyed a streak of her hair purple. Curtains open to Neil sitting and Chelsea standing on the roof. Hey! Uh, uh, what are you doing? I saw you in there, by the way. I saw you look straight at me and then walk away without coming up to even say a word. <laughs> so sorry. I, I just needed to step out for a bit. I'm not, I I'm not used to this much noise. I can tell. You mind if I join you? I suppose not. Good, because it's getting cramped in there. Chelsea sits down. They're both silent for a brief period. It's really beautiful out tonight, isn't it? It's breathtaking. I think this is the first time I've been able to make out the stars since I moved here. Everything's always so bright in the city. They seem to get lost in translation. I find that if I squint a little, I can almost see the lines connecting the constellations. Constellations are odd. <laughs> Who looked at that series of stars a thousand years ago and decided that they were a dragon? I enjoy them. They give your mind something to do. I just find them outdated. Their entire function was to view the vastness of the universe in a way we could maybe comprehend, finding ways to interpret them as images we are already familiar with, Science has come a long, long way since their creation. Do you think that we would have surpassed the need for them? Neil is silent for a moment. I don't know if it's necessarily a need for them. They're just fun to look for, and they're kind of cool. I think that's a good enough reason to have them, don't you? This time, Chelsea is silent. I suppose so. They're definitely a welcome distraction from the fact that these stars are a billion miles away from us, and the universe is larger than we can even imagine. That's, that's the reason I have a hard time believing in an afterlife. This current existence is so unbelievably vast, 
Is there really enough sentient consciousness to occupy an existence beyond our own? Mm, it makes the idea of reincarnation seem all the more realistic. <laughs> I think I've always had an unspoken belief in reincarnation. I think it just seems to make the most sense. What comes from the earth returns to it. It's, it's, it's reused, like every other cycle of life. Have you ever heard of the egg theory? <laughs> I can't say that I have. Okay, so it's this theory that when you die, you'll speak to an omnipotent being. They'll explain to you that you are to be reincarnated as another human being from any point in human history. The cycle will repeat itself until you've lived every life there is. So every act of kindness expressed is an act of kindness towards yourself. Every feeling of sadness and happiness or anything in between has either been felt or will be felt by you. When the cycle completes itself and there's no more lives left to live, you'll remember everything you experienced and then you too will become a god, just like them. The entire universe serves as an egg of sorts, a cocoon for you to reside and learn in until you're ready to break free and accept the burden of omnipotence. Must be a pretty damn big egg, huh? <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> that's what you got from that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. This is some food for thought, though. It's it's definitely a little bit strange, but it's an interesting thing to think about. It's almost comforting in a way. It always just makes me think about all the amazing people throughout history. I would love to see the world through their lenses. To do what they do and be what they are. It's odd to think about observing a life you've lived through the one you're currently living. I guess that's what we'd both be doing right now, though. Assuming I hadn't already lived through yours. I guess we're both just sitting here talking to ourselves then. <laughs> God, that's weird to think about. Yeah, I guess so. In any case, I'm sure once I get to yours, it'll be one of the memorable ones. I wouldn't mind being you someday. You do realize how strange that sounds, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry, it sounded better in my head. Uh, most things do, don't they? For the record, I wouldn't mind being you either. <laughs> you know, for some reason, it doesn't sound as weird when you say it. <laughs> you confuse me, Neil. You really do. They sit in silence once again for a brief time, watching the stars. How do you like it? The city, I mean. It's okay. There's a lot to do, but it's cold and, and loud, and it makes my head spin. That's what others have told me as well. I've been here all my life, so it's all I know. Do you think you're going to stick around? I'm not sure. I think more and more about moving back home every day. I just, I don't think I'm cut out for city life. Mm. Well, the city will miss you if you leave. You are a fine addition to its numbers. <laughs> You'll always have a friend here if you choose to come back and visit. And a good one at that. Uncomfortably long pause in the conversation. It really is gorgeous out tonight. You can almost smell the moonlight. It's beautiful. Just beautiful. Neil and Chelsea look up at the stars in silence for a few seconds, and Neil looks over at her once before tilting his head upwards again. Lights dim, curtains close, the end. Hello, 
Um, my name is Eva Gray. I am a junior at Williamson High School, the writer of Death's Promptest Game, and one of the winners of the Youth Play Arts Festival. Um, this opportunity is really amazing for me because this is actually the first play that I've ever written. Um, I've acted a small handful of times and have been in pit the past couple of years, so this is a really nice opportunity to be able to kind of be on a different side of things um, and kind of see what I write come to life. So I'm super excited to see what they do with the play. Um, I left some things open to interpretation, so I'm excited to see kind of where they go with that. Um, I actually started writing it. There's a monologue in kind of the second scene. Um, I started there and kind of branched off of that. I really love monologues. It's super dramatic, um, but that's kind of where I started. That's kind of where the inspiration came from. Um, my sponsoring teacher is Katie Nolan. Uh, she's super amazing. She's my English teacher and she encouraged all of us to enter our plays and another student from my class actually won too. So congratulations to Caleb Barker and all of the other winners. So that was super cool that another student from my school is here as well. Um, my mentor is Eric Guild. Uh, him and I worked super well together. We had about weekly phone calls. Um, we sent notes. He sent notes to me and I would change things and then send him a new edit. And then we would have a phone call and kind of talk over it a bit. So he was super helpful. Um, it was great learning about the editing process and what um, a lot of writers go through for that. So it's kind of really cool to be on a different side of things. So it's been really great. Um, I just want to thank the people who set this up. It's a great opportunity, so thank you so much. Um, the actors of my play, I haven't met you, but I'm super happy that you're working on this and I hope you love it as much as I do. Um, thank you to my mentor, Eric. It has been great working with you. My sponsoring teacher, Mrs. Nolan, it has been wonderful <laughs> being your student and I really appreciate all of the you know feedback and the help that you've given us. Um, thank you to my family, for always supporting me and my friends who are here today who support me as well. So I'm super excited to watch this come to life and thank you for all being here. Hi, I'm Minda Nyquist, the director of Death's Promptest Game by Ava Gray. Ramona and Heloise walk together to the table in their home. I have a surprise for you, Heloise. Well, Ramona, don't make me guess. Tell me already. I received a letter from the mail in England. A marriage proposition. I accepted. The family has money, so I'll be well off. I'm headed there in May. You're going to England? Do you even know them? Oh, I of course I'm going. The plans have already been arranged for me to leave, even on a big extravagant steamship. <laughs> Mother plans to go with me, so I won't be in England alone, and I'll be okay. Besides, you can always visit. I've been stuck here my whole life, and I need new scenery, and this is a great opportunity. Well, I don't know. That seems awful far, don't you think? Did Ramona tell you the news? Isn't that wonderful? I've always wanted to go to England. Heloise walks over to coffee and pours each of them a cup, which they start to drink. Well, of course it's wonderful, but who will I make coffee for in the mornings if you both are across the globe? Oh, don't be ridiculous, Heloise. You know you can follow. Heloise adds sugar to Ramona's coffee. Well, of course not. This is my home, and I'm not leaving it for some silly marriage proposal far away from home. Does she even really know who she's marrying? Your silence tells me enough. This is atrocious. How could you leave your home for someone you don't even know? <coughs> Are you all right, dear? I know this is upsetting, but just... Ramona coughs. Heloise stands next to a lone memorial in the woods. Sorrow fills my heart. I walk through time longing for you to breathe back to life, but the stiff chains of death prove bearing. Oh, Ramona, why have you left? Your impending departure for England wounded my heart, but in death it shattered eternally. I plod through warm, gentle earth while you lay captive in an icy tomb. It is too much to bear. Death, I call upon you, my confidant. Come to me, hear my anger, for you have taken my sister. Pull me under the depths of death. Take your promptest chance. 
Heloise plunges a knife into her chest and collapses to the ground. Blackout. Show yourself, death, for all the pain and sorrow you cause. No mercy is shown. Why am I alive? Ah, Heloise. <clears throat> you are not alive, child. Your unfinished business has brought you to the in-between of life and death. The choices you make determine your everlasting. You are calling on me now, but I came before, several times and long ago. Do you not remember? <laughs> to me, death, mortals are mere toys of fate which I use for enjoyment. A life shuffling off the coil for me is like a fox finally capturing the hare, a spring of a calculated trap, and the light is snuffed. You see, I did not listen to your call because my trap was not set. The fox could not hear the hare's bounds. Why have you waited for me? Why have you been waiting for the touch of death? I've been patient for the trap to spring, for the fox to catch my wild tail. Without my companion, I can continue no more. How dare you steal her from me? <laughs> I wish for the noise to stop. I have heard the earth is silent and calming. Why am I trapped in between life and death? Haven't I suffered enough? You only stay in between if you have unfinished dealings. You should be asking yourself why you are here and where you are. What is your unfinished business here on Earth, which prevents you from being at peace? Well, <laughs> I shall also ask Heloise, what could I have done in my little game to anger a mortal? Can you not think past yourself? I do too think my past myself. I... And here is my point most perfectly. Of all my questions, that is the only one you decide to respond to. Now, I shall ask you again. Why has my game angered a mere little speck like you? And why shall I continue this conversation rather than letting you seethe alone for eternity? I am cross for the simplest of reasons. You, Death, are the harbinger of pain and misfortune to many lives, including my own. You have taken my Ramona from me, and thereafter my joy. And then you cut my fate line with sharp scissors, and I fell deep into this trap. This is not fair, Death. You steal and you take, and in order to even speak to you, you steal and you take again. You mindless fool. <laughs> Don't you realize that you helped me set the trap for poor dear Ramona? And even your own. Don't you remember? Shall I remind you then? Well then, I shall take that as a yes. You and you alone were a pawn in my game. You slipped that poison into a drink, didn't you? I, well, I... Oh, you cannot fool me, Heloise. Don't you forget that I was in attendance. Now tell the truth. Well, yes, I did slip that poison, but it wasn't, make, was it, it wasn't to make her get caught in the trap of the game. I never meant for her to die. I really never did. It was to only make her sick, I swear. And... Oh, but, but why would you give her something that would make her sick if not to kill her? What was the reasoning? Well, you know the reasoning. You know all. Or at least you act like it. Well, who is the one stuck here? Who has unfinished business? It is most definitely not I, as I may leave at any time. Would you like my assistance in getting through or not? Well, I gave it to her because her being sick would force her to stay home. She would be far too weak to travel to England. She doesn't even know who she's marrying. Ah, she... I see. So it is your own game of fate, isn't it? Your own game of playing with her feeble fate string with sharp scissors. Oh, I know how it is. You people get bored or disappointed in life and try to do my job for me, or rather, with me. Well, Heloise, I, for one, appreciate the fine entertainment. I didn't have to do much. Just had to sit back and watch... <laughs> oh, besides, I love a good plot twist. Your own suicide really pushes your narrative, doesn't it? The befallen sister dies of sorrow, begs death to take her. Oh, you hate me so, yet you call on me. What will your family think of you when they find out the truth? 
The pull of the game, or rather the dance of death, was enticing. This was supposed to pull her in, yet set her free of sickness. You had other ideas, death. This was never the plan, and the only way I could escape and speak with you is to spur my own trap. Hmm. So what other ideas? Don't you realize that you started all of this? But with the kind of person she was, I would expect you to understand. She would have gone off to England, and Mother would have gone with her. Death snaps. The next scene, actors move dreamlike and slowly into position. Death and Heloise's mother are in her home. Death, as the coroner, gives Mrs. Green news. Oh, Mrs. Green, I regret to inform you of the results of my autopsy. Um, you see, Ramona was killed by ingesting rat poison. Oh. It seems that a dose was slipped into her food or drink. Do, do you possibly know? Is there anyone who wanted Ramona gone? <laughs> you see, Heloise, you point a finger at me for causing hurt and pain, yet you have done the same for your own benefit. How can you be so hypocritical to me when you intentionally cause the same pain my game causes? This conversation has completed my unfinished business, hasn't it? Just let me go. I know, I was wrong. I really do. But I had to do it. She was going to leave, and so was Mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how silly you are to think that I would do you a favor. However much you have entertained me, I owe you nothing at all. Don't you remember what I told you earlier? I work for nobody but myself. I follow my own motives, my own wishes, my own desires. Get that through your thick skull. What if I told you the in-between is a piece of my game? You are dead. <laughs> Enjoy your everlasting, <laughs> your personal hell. I work for myself, not for you. You have made a dooming mistake. You are selfish, both in life and in death. And that selfishness has brought your punishment upon you. After all, even in death, your wrongdoings catch up to you. <laughs> death snaps again. The scene and Mrs. Green slowly moves back, dreamlike. Eloise is forever banished to watch the conversation on repeat for all of eternity. Mrs. Green, I regret to inform you of the results of my autopsy. You see, Ramona was killed by ingesting rat poison. Oh! It seems that a dose was slipped into her food or drink. Do you possibly know, are there any people who wanted Ramona gone? My daughter. Eloise, I know it was her. I just know it was. Death snaps. The next scene, actors again move dreamlike and slowly into position. Eloise drops to her knees. <clears throat> Mrs. Green, I regret to inform you of the results of my autopsy. You see, Ramona was killed by ingesting rat poison. Oh. It seems that a dose was slipped into her food or drink. Do you possibly know, are there any people who wanted Ramona gone? Oh. Oh. My daughter, Eloise. I know it was her, I just know it was. Mrs. Green, I regret to inform you of the results of my autopsy. You see, Ramona was killed by no! ingesting rat poison. Oh. Blackout. Hi, I'm Alyssa. I'm from Kalkaska, and I go to high school there. Uh, it's online this year. <laughs> but uh, I also go to Front Street Writers at Career Tech Center. Um, my sponsor teacher is Miss Scollin, and my mentor is Miss Shepard Bates. 
I wrote macaroni and my inspiration was that it was an assignment I had to do for school. Uh, this is a really cool opportunity. You know, I love being in plays and it's just as fun to write them. So that was super cool. My play was originally just like two friends hanging out, but then I decided I wanted to make it more serious. So I changed it and added some more serious themes, which I think should be covered more in entertainment. I feel like uh, shows like BoJack Horseman are good examples of how to properly portray stuff like that. And uh, I learned that I really like to write dialogue. It's super fun. It was also really cool to get to work with my mentor to make my play better. Uh, I like, you, you can always improve on something that you write, and I think that I did. Anyway, I'm really glad that I got to be a finalist, and thanks to everyone that helped me get here. Hi, I'm Rachel Harrell. I had the privilege of directing Macaroni by Alyssa Lancer. Scene one, an outdoor seating area for a local cafe in a downtown setting. Sean and Laura walk on, carrying drinks and sit at a table. It's been so long since we've been able to hang out. Uh, too bad my break is only 15 minutes. Whatever happened to your uh, internship thing, anyway? Ugh, it turned out to be boring as hell. What's the point of a career opportunity if it isn't any fun? I think the point is that it's just a good opportunity. Yeah, well, the contract was only for six months. What matters now is that we can party! Hey. Woo! <laughs> I tried to show up at your place unannounced a few days ago, but you weren't home. Just your hot roommate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His name is Aaron, and you've met him before. I have, but he is your hot roommate, so you know. I am well aware of his... Attractiveness level. We live together. I mean, I've known him since I started college. You told me before he was a, the host at some crazy college party. You vomited all over his couch. <laughs> you had to spend the night there and became friends or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Cute reminder friendship story. Yeah, that's the story. It's a good thing he was there to help me out. But I mean, there's more that's to it than just- That's the main part, though. <laughs> we don't need an entire exposition, nerd. All right. All right. But, you never told me that you showed up at the apartment. That's fine with me, but I do like to know when people are coming and going. Not because I'm a control freak, but because our door handle is damaged, and if the door doesn't close properly, mice can get in. Which isn't that bad, but I don't like spending too much money on mouse traps. I'd rather spend it on cheap Thai food. I thought Aaron told you I showed up. Mm-mm. You know, he probably forgot. No problem, though. Oh, wow. I guess he didn't tell you what happened between us. Uh, no, what happened? Oh, it's not what you think. We didn't sleep together or anything. But when I came in, he totally freaked out and thought I was a burglar. He threw a vase at me. It missed, so I'm fine. Then we argued and I left. It was weird. Why would he not tell me? At a vase? Since when did we own a vase? It was dumb of him not to tell you. I was going to, but he insisted on doing it himself. I bet he would have just kept it a secret. <laughs> I mean, at least you told me. I'm still kind of mad, though. You're paying for my coffee. That's fair. Honestly, I'm glad you're not the type of person to get mad at people for simple things. No! I wouldn't get mad over something simple. <laughs> Aaron <laughs> is way better at being mad. Uh, you should have seen him when he got tomatoes and mustard on his burger. He went, like... Full Karen. Full, oh, really? Yeah, really. He yelled at everyone until his whole meal was free. It was impressive in an awful sort of way. He has kind of been acting weird lately, now that I think about it. Oh, hey, I gotta go. See you later. Yep, see ya. Scene two, an apartment living room. It's getting dark outside. Sean is sitting on the couch. Aaron walks on. There's food in the kitchen if you want mac and cheese. Why do you always make that? Aren't you lactose intolerant? 
Yeah. But it tastes good, aren't you? Who isn't? But I don't make a big fuss about it like most people. I don't spend $20 on a pack of pig enzymes every two weeks. I'd rather feel like shit and save money than feel slightly better and lose money. I'd rather spend my money on other things. I disagree, uh, but respect that. I mean, being in pain to save money is low-key badass, except, you know, it's just, you know, being lactose intolerant. Whoa, 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 just lactose intolerant? Hey, my stomach battles the lactose until it is completely oh. expelled from my digestive system. Yeah, oh, whatever you say, Aaron, whatever you say. Aaron walks to the kitchen and returns with a bowl of mac and cheese. <laughs> That's right. Uh, 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 what's right? Me. Duh. Oh, okay. Makes sense to me. From the kitchen, something clatters loudly onto the floor. Sean jumps at the sound. Aaron stays still, eating from his bowl with a fork. Oh, look at you, scared of a little kitchen utensil that I had precariously perched on the edge of the counter. Hey, this food is kind of cold. I didn't get scared. And if it's cold, then go heat it up. No. Aaron sits on the couch next to Sean. Why don't you ever sit on any of the other furniture? Sean gestures to a few cheap lawn chairs. Uh, because our other furniture is shit, Sean. The vomit couch reigns supreme. Now move over, my stomach hurts. All right. I only vomited on it once. <laughs> And neither of us will ever forget that. Sean sighs and makes room for Aaron on the couch. I'm going to be honest with you. You're kind of an awful roommate. What? Really? Why? Where, where is this coming from? Listen, listen, listen. I'm sorry I insulted uh, the chairs that you bought yourself, but hey, they are not comfortable. It's not just about the chairs. How about the fact that you threw a vase at my best friend? You didn't think I'd figure that out, did you? It's, it's one thing for you to break things on accident and then not replace anything, but throwing a vase at my best friend, really? Wait, you... You don't consider me your best friend? That's what you got out of what I just said? For the record, I can have multiple best friends. So why didn't you just say my best friend and not one of my best friends? Because that's... Not what matters right now. What matters is that you threw a vase at Laura and thought she was a burglar for whatever reason. I didn't even know we had a vase, so that was probably the only one. Hey, well, you know what? You know what? It matters to me. We're roommates because of our best friendship. If you don't even consider me to be your best friend, then why live with me here at all? Ugh. I didn't tell you because <laughs> I knew it would bother you. I tried to avoid bothering my best friend. It was late. I don't like burglars. <laughs> That's it? No one likes burglars. We don't have anything worth burgling. Maybe the TV. I, I don't need a reason for my actions. I don't even need a direction in life. I'm not criticizing your lifestyle. I would just like to know when you do something like that. Well, you found out anyway, didn't just... you? Just... <sighs> Tell me next time, okay? Fine, fine. Good. Fine. All right. Gotta go to the bathroom. Don't eat all the mocha macaroni. You broke a vase, so you can't eat all the food that I made and purchased. <sighs> Don't fall in. <laughs> Aaron finishes his bowl of macaroni and sets it on a coffee table. He glances around, scat scratching the side of his neck. He taps his hands on his thighs before standing up and opening a drawer on an end table. Where did I put those? From off stage, the sound of several items falling can be heard. Aaron looks up. Sean, you good? I told you not to fall in. <laughs> Aaron continues to look for something. Sean enters, carrying a plastic bag. Aaron, what the hell are these? Uh, <laughs> it, it isn't what it looks like. I just, I, I need those. Yeah? What for? These don't look like your typical legal drugs that stink up the whole apartment. Sean, 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 just give them back, please. You know, these look a lot like what the doctor gave you when you had that oh, really deep cut on your arm. The ones that were supposed to last you for three days. Sean, But please. those pills were prescribed four weeks ago. Where did you even get these? Aaron reaches towards Sean, trying to swipe the bag away, but misses. <laughs> that doesn't matter. 
You, you can't just take those. I, I tried to go without them, and I, 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 I vomited like all day. You told me that you had food poisoning. Well, I, I, I thought I did too, but I didn't. Then, why didn't you tell me once you figured out that you had a problem? I, I could have helped. You need to see a doctor. Well, I, I, I was going to, but you're always so busy with school, and I, I thought, well, I, I could just, I thought I could work it out myself. I still can. Just, just give those back and I'll, I'll fix it myself. You don't need to worry. I'm fine, okay? I'm You're fine. not fine. I'm very worried. I always am. You go out early and come back late. You got into a fight a few days ago. I heard you calling your parents to ask for money the other day. Is this why? Drugs? <laughs> You're hardly the same person I met in college. Sean? Aaron plops defeatedly onto the couch, burying his head into his hands. Oh my god. A Aaron, are you... I'm fine, I'm Sean fine. Sean sits next to Aaron, putting an arm around him in a comforting manner. Hey, it, it'll be okay. No, it won't. It's too late. It's not too late. Just as long as you let me help you, we can figure this out. Together. I always help you when you let me, anyway. How long did you say? Four weeks? Yeah, four weeks. And in those four weeks, you've changed. I, I didn't want to see it, but everything is starting to make sense now. Uh, you've been worried about people breaking in to steal your stuff. You freaked out when your order was wrong. You got into a fight, and apparently, you threw a vase at Laura, who you should have recognized. I, I should have known that something was wrong. Who else knows what you've been doing? It, 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 it may sound bad now, but... I, th I think that I can maybe still fix this. Uh, you said it yourself. It's not too late. <laughs> That's not what I meant. It isn't too late for you to get help. You can't just get out of, over an addiction on your own. Aaron suddenly stands and tries to grab the bag again. He catches hold one side, but the other remains in Sean's grasp. I, I can try, though. We, we, don't need, we don't have enough money for a doctor anyway. Just let, let go. I just need a few. Sean, pulling on his side of the bag. He stands. Just a few? How many have you been taking? Aaron uses one hand to grab Sean's wrist and starts to pull on it. I trying don't... Trying to loosen his grasp on the bag. I don't know. Just give them back. Sean, stepping back, still pulling on the bag. Aaron! Aaron, stop! You're hurting my arm! Aaron gasps, letting go and stepping away from Sean, who takes a few steps back. Aaron walks up to him and grabs his shoulders. Sean... <laughs> Sean, I, I didn't mean to do that. You, you gotta understand. You understand, right? Sean lightly pushes Aaron away, then rubs at his wrist. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay the night at Laura's. These are coming with me. Do you have any more? No. And that, no, that, that's it. Just one night, right? Probably. We'll see. Why can't you stay? Sean walks to the door. Because I'm tired of dealing with your shit. Because this is still me helping. Sean. Sean! Thanks. Thanks for the mac and cheese! Hello. My name is Tyler McNally. Uh, I wrote the play A Voice at Night. Michael Henney, uh, my mentor, uh, helped me work through it and has taught me a lot and how much I can add to something from where it starts and watch it grow from there. Uh, my teacher, Miss Scolland, helped me work through it a lot in the beginning process when I was just starting to make it and before I turned it into the competition. And speaking of the competition, when I first heard that I was one of the winners for it, I, I was ecstatic. I, it was insane. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to work 
on this and be able to have it be put live performance and hopefully next year we'll be able to do that you know live and other than that there's not much i can say other than thank you again so thank you three times thank you Hi, I'm Melissa May, the director of A Voice at Night, a play by Tyler McNally. Scene one, James is helping Tony walk. It seems that Tony has injured him, his leg somehow. Tony has one arm over James and the other hanging down. They both seem to be rushing and at the same time very tired and out of breath. Come on, we have to get back to town before dark, James. I don't want to have to stay the night out here. You think I do, Tony? Look, as much as I hate to say it, I think we're going the wrong way, man. We've been going in this direction for an hour. We should have been back to town by now. I think we should stop and rest. James stops and helps lean Tony against a tree. James, we should keep going. The sun is setting. Tony tries to stand back up, but James quickly pushes him back down. I don't want to stay out here any more than you do, Tony. But if you didn't run down that hill and tripped, we probably could keep going. Don't blame me. You're the one who's supposed to know the way back. Well, I'm sorry if I got a little sidetracked and forgot where we were when you hurt your leg. Shut up. You think I wanted to break my leg? Here, I'm going to go look for firewood. You know how to make a fire? Well, no, but I thought that it would be, be better than doing nothing. Besides, like I said, the sun is setting. If you leave now, it'd be dark before you can get back. Yeah, that's a good point. So what should we do? I mean, what can we do? Both of the boys look up as the lights dim until the stage is completely and totally pitch black. Then a stick being snapped can be heard from out of the darkness. Did you hear that? Of course I heard that. How could I not? You think my leg being hurt clogs my ears? What do you think it was? I don't know, but don't go towards it. Another snap can be heard, but louder and closer. What's to stop it from coming towards us? A harsh wind can be heard washing over them and then becomes complete silence. Absolutely, Absolutely nothing. nothing. Ah! Who, who said that? Who's there? I said that, and, and I'm here. Who are you? What's up with all the personal questions? Mind your own business. Oh, but before you do, can I ask a few of my own questions? What? No. Go away! Hang on, Tony. Maybe they can help us. Yeah, right. What kind of person is in the woods in the middle of the night? Perhaps they can tell us how to get back to town. Indeed, Indeed I, I can. can. That was actually what I was going to ask you. If, if you, you needed, needed any help, help getting, getting back. back. You, you see, see, I overheard you a while ago while the sun was still up. up. Why didn't you come and ask us if we needed help back then? Well, that's beside the point. You, you see... see I would, I would be, be delighted, delighted to, to help, help you two out. out. I don't know about this. They said they're gonna help us. Don't be so rude, dude. So, you can help us get back to town? Yup. Of course. At a price. We don't have any money. I don't, don't want, want your, your money. money. I, I simply, simply request to hear, hear a, a joke. joke. A joke? What do you mean by a joke? I want you to tell me a joke. And, and a, a good, good one at that. that. It also has to be one I haven't, haven't heard, heard before. before. Are you serious? Absolutely. You see, I never joke when it comes to, well, jokes. Who the heck would want a joke in exchange to help get someone home? Me. That's who. And if you don't want to abide and tell me a joke, I'll, I'll be on, on my way. way. Okay, wait. So all we have to do is tell you a joke and you'll help us home? That's, That's what, what I, I said. Okay. How hard could it be? Here, let me try. <clears throat> Did you hear about the bald eagle? With a wig? I have. Huh. I guess you knew that one. Unfortunately for you, correct. correct. I, I want, want to hear, hear one I have not heard, heard before. before. Watch and learn. Why didn't the skeleton cross the road? Because, because he, he didn't, didn't have, have the guts, guts to, to do so. so. What? How do you know? What's black, white, and red all over? Well, it's either a zebra, zebra with, with a sunburn, sunburn a, a newspaper, newspaper and, and or two nuns in a night fight. fight. You knew all the answers to that one. How many cockroaches does it take to screw in a light bulb? No, no one knows. When, when the, the light comes on, on they, they all scatter. scatter. I do say, that's definitely, definitely one, one of my favorite, favorite jokes. What's the difference between a piano and a fish? You can tune, tune a piano, but you can't tune, tune a fish. Okay, well, I'm out.
I'm not giving up yet. Hey, knock knock. Who's, Who's there? there? Boo. <sighs> Boo who? It. It's just a joke. No, no need to cry about, about it. it. Hey, that's my line. I did say it had to be a joke. I, I didn't know, didn't, didn't I? Know. Dang it. You really don't want to have any more jokes? No, do you? No. Well, well then, then, it seems you boys don't have any jokes, jokes for, for me. me. Please help us get home. I know we don't have any more jokes, but his leg is hurt. We can't just walk around here aimlessly. Please, I'm begging you. I'm sorry. sorry but my, my conditions, conditions were clear. clear. I we want, want a joke, joke in exchange for directions. directions. Come on, give us a break. We told you like a zillion jokes and you knew them all. You, you didn't, didn't let me finish. finish. I did ask, ask for a joke. joke. However, I never said you had to tell it to me right, right now. Yeah. I will give you one, one day, day to come up with a joke. joke. You see, I really enjoy hearing a new, new one. one. I will return tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. And unless you tell me one that I don't know, I will leave you for, for good. good and you will be left here. Wandering, wandering aimlessly. What? We can't stay out here for another day. Tony, I don't think we have a choice in the matter. If that's what we have to do, we'll do it. Scene two. Tony and James are sitting down at the base of a tree, tossing jokes back and forth at one another while playing in the dirt. Ooh, here's one. Why did the chicken cross the playground? I don't know why. To get to the other slide? Add it to the list. How much does that make? Twenty-ish, I think. What's the matter? Hungry? No, it's just, you heard what it sounded like, didn't you? It was unusual, to say the least. Yeah, but why are you referring to him as a it? Did you see him? Well, no, but... Exactly. Who's to say it's a person? The voice that we heard last night was almost human and animal, like more than some, what someone's voice. Well, maybe he just has a sore throat. Also, I'm hungry. Could you pass me one of those delicious granola bars? James throws Tony a granola bar from his backpack laying next to him. Don't you remember the thing that you said? What person is wandering out here at night with no flashlight? And when it runs into someone, it doesn't say anything until it's pitch black out. That's not normal human behavior, and neither is asking for a joke in exchange for directions. What do you mean, didn't say anything until it was pitch black out? Yeah, remember? It told us that it, did, that it hurt us when the sun was still out, and... James freezes, then looks at Tony. You don't think. James stands up and begins to look around. What? That has been listening to us this whole time and hearing every joke we've said? Oh, now that's creepy. Shh. Keep your voice down. Can you try standing? We've got to get out of here. Relax, would you? I'll try standing. Tony begins to try and stand by grasping the tree he was sitting at the base of. When he's at his feet, he tries to walk, but utterly fails, falling to the ground. Ah! Oh! Are you okay? No, I'm not okay. It hurts even more now than it did yesterday. Dang it. Now there's no way we can go then. So, now what? If you're right about whatever that thing is, it's been listening to us come up with jokes. And I can't walk. What do we do? I don't know. James helps Tony lean back up against the tree, then moves a small log so Tony's leg can rest on it. Well... My left leg is pretty much useless. Is that good? Yeah, that'll be all right. Good, I... Wait. What? Say that again? Huh? That'll be all right? That's it. I've got the perfect joke. What is it? James walks over to Tony and begins to whisper into his ear as the lights dim and the stage becomes pitch black once more. I'm back. It's, it's been, been a day. day. Do, do you, you have, have a joke, joke for me? me? We do, but first, we want to ask you a few questions. Is, is that, that so? It is. Starting with, what are you? Just, Just another person trying, trying to, to get by in this strange world, world of ours. Um, okay. Second question. Were you listening to us talk during the day? I was. I, I heard, heard every joke, joke you two spat, spat out, out at one, one another, another, except for the last one that you two whispered to each other. And, and now, now I, I believe it is my turn to ask you a question. question. What's, What's the, the joke? joke? Oh yeah, I, heard that. I forgot that you told me that one earlier, James. I remember what it was. Well, let's, let's hear, hear it, it then, then, shall we? We were gonna use that one, but... But it was a joke about my broken leg, and I didn't find it that funny. People who get hurt badly shouldn't get joked about. I know that now. What do you mean? 
Well, back in town, there was a guy that got into a real bad car crash. And it was reported and talked about all around the country on how bad the guy ended up that I'm sure even you must have heard of it. I'm, I'm afraid, afraid not. not. How, how bad, bad did the man end up? He completely shattered all the bones in his left leg and in his left arm. Well, did he survive? Yeah, he survived. He's completely all right now. <laughs> oh, 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 man, you, you got, got me good, good with that one. one. I owe you some, some directions, directions to town. town. Really? Yep. Thank you. I can't believe we can finally go home. It's, it's about, about 50 meters to your right. What? Are you serious? Unfortunately, Unfortunately yes. yes. What was the point of all of this? We could have been home days ago. You can't be serious. Why? Why did you do this? You see, I help people when they have given up. And you two had given, given up. up. So I gave you hope, and I gave you directions, directions home. home. I just had a little oh, fun doing, doing it. it. There's, There's no, no harm in that. I have been eating dry, tasteless, disgusting granola bars for two days, for nothing. I thought you liked my granola bars. Well, I lied. That's besides the point, though. Do you know how much our parents must be worried about us? Well, well I, assume. I assume very much, but well, I, I helped you. you. Now you can go, go home. home. You didn't help us. You wasted our time. You, you spent, spent a whole day thinking, thinking of jokes. jokes. In my opinion, that time was well, well spent. spent. My leg has been broken. I need medical attention, and you say that my time has been better spent thinking of jokes? Well, well when you, you say, say it like that... that. Nope, I'm done. James, come to help me out. We're out of here. Yep, I'm done with this. James helping Tony both begin walking off the stage. Oh, oh come, come on, guys. guys. Isn't, Isn't it about, about the, the journey, journey, not the, the destination? destination? That's dumb. You're dumb. Bye-bye now. Once Tony and James are both completely off the stage, the voice begins talking to themselves. No, no you're, you're dumb. dumb. Last time I helped anyone lost in the woods. I'll just eat the next ones, I guess. Oh, oh well, well, off I go. Into the night. What adventure awaits me next? I really need to talk to my parents. I wonder if they've been taking good care of the salamanders. Man, I hope so. Into the woods. Is that a title for a movie? I think it is. I don't know that I've seen it, though. What, what movies, movies have, have I seen? seen? I don't know. This, this is, is going, going to be, be a boring walk. walk. My name is Maya Siegel. I'm in the 12th grade at Interlochen Arts Academy. Uh, my teacher is Brie Cavallaro, and my mentor for the play festival was Bert Goldstein. Uh, I'm originally from Roanoke, Virginia, but I've been uh, going to school in Michigan for the past two years. Uh, and so my play was called Snake Play, and it's about um, a, a boy who has a pet snake and the pet snake is about to eat him um, but really it's about a family it's about the loneliness of being in a family unit uh, and it's about sort of the, the relationship between a mother and a child um, and as well as sort of the creepy unknowingness of not knowing if your pet really loves you not knowing if sort of that love is just a, a projection um, that you're putting onto an animal. Um, so yeah, my inspiration for this play was uh, my mother would tell me a story about a kid who was eaten by his pet snake uh, when I was really young. And that was uh, sort of a scare tactic so that I did not get close to uh, exotic animals. Um, it worked. I. Uh, will never own a snake, um, but I think one of the best experiences of this mentorship uh, with the play festival was working with um, Dr. Bert Goldstein, and uh, he really helps me in in editing the play and sort of focusing on the minute details. He gave me so many wonderful. Um, reading lists, uh, and uh, he introduced me to more of Sarah Rule, who is a playwright I really love, and now 
Um, in college, I'm going to possibly be working with Sarah Rule, so that is really exciting. Um, and I, he really helped me sort of dream out how I actually wanted the play to look. And I think uh, while writing a play, you sort of have a, a vague idea of that sometimes, and, and sometimes that's really concrete. Uh, but he was like, what sort of lighting are you thinking of? Um, or, or for the, the fight between the boy and the snake, um, do you want sort of this to be shown to the audience? Do you want uh, sort of the lights to hide part of it? Um, and so that was really, really helpful and sort of took me from a space where I was thinking about words to I was thinking about uh, visuals and, and space and time and um, you people. And that was so, so amazing. So thank you so much to the Play Festival and to Bert um, and everyone who has really, really helped put this together. It's been such an amazing experience. and. I can't wait for more. Hi, my name is Nick Viox, and I'll be directing Snake Play by Maya Siegel. Characters. Mom. Young. Has on makeup, but looks chronically tired and pushed around. Works in an office, but doesn't have her own cubicle. Wears cheap business clothes, ones that don't really fit her. Son. Looks around 14 years old, but would be the smallest in his class. Should bring to mind those kids who wanted to be engineers. If his family had more money, he would have a 3D printer. Instead, he has Legos. Mom, remember to feed Cricket extra tonight. He's not used to sleeping in his carrying cage. He's not hungry. Is he feeling better? Baby, he's not sick, exactly. Uh, hand me the cleaning supplies. This cage is rank. Well, why is he acting sad? I think cricket may be a little too much for me to handle right now. As soon as he costs a trip to the vet, you want to throw him out? It's not like that. Hey, tell me, why does a snake stop eating? I mean, why does it save its energy? He wants his mice. Feed him his mice. <sighs> Sometimes I have to get like that for her to feed me. Sometimes I stare at the mice and wonder how they taste. A boy can get tired of frozen pizza rolls, and even mice start to look good. Once, I watched Cricket eat one, and I collected its little bones. They're in an Altoids box under my bed. Some, uh, I assemble them, try to make a full body, like a puzzle. Sometimes I want to eat the bones, crunch them up, and sprinkle them on my Cocoa Puffs. I want to be like him. I want to know what it's like to spit up bones. She doesn't have to imagine. She spits just like Cricket. She spits out all the bad stuff I've done. The people who are dead to us. Does this stuff right to my face like their bones. Hey, tell me, why does he stretch out alongside you like that? You have all those books on snakes. Tell me why. We're friends. He likes to show his belly to me. He stretches out on his bed, mimicking a snake. You need a goldfish. Maybe a kitten? Just not something with fangs. I like fangs. Besides, Cricket doesn't bite me, and he actually likes me, too. Baby, I like you. I'll get you a dog if you want, a small one. So, the vet thought it might be healthier for him to go somewhere else. Where else? We're great snake parents. Where else, Mom? I don't know. A, a place where they stack the cages next to each other, charge kids a few bucks to tap on the glass and get hissed at? Or the zoo downtown? Or a house with large adults? Why is being large an issue? You don't even like large men. You said that yourself. That is completely different. I was talking on the phone with a friend. And you shouldn't have been listening. Mom, there's not, there's only two of us in this house. There's not much else I can listen to. My friends say I should put myself out there. I'm young, I chew with my mouth closed. I got a bubble butt. The last man didn't turn out so hot. He's in Costa Rica somewhere, clicking kids into harnesses and holding them above the sky. Zipped in tight with real fatherly hands. Ooh, he was wild. He wanted to swallow me whole. When he made a move on me, his eyes would glaze over all animal. And when his eyes bulged too far, he'd kill small animals, like squirrels and traps and stuff, neighborhood cats, that kind of thing. When he'd bring back gifts from some backyard exotic dealer, once a monkey in a bamboo cage. 
If I've learned anything from CSI, these were the makings of a psychopath. These dating app men aren't much better. Their eyes glaze over too, but at least no gifts. Oh, how can you sleep in the same room as this cage? It stinks to all hell. He doesn't even spend time in there. He's with, he sleeps with me every night, you know that. That's not good. No, 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 you can't do that anymore. A boy should not sleep with his snake. It's weird. You're being weird. What? Mom, this is coming out of nowhere. And I hate it when you call things weird. <sighs> I'm not weird. Nothing I do is weird. I can't tiptoe around it anymore. You're a big kid, and I can tell you. So when I brought the snake to the vet, she told me that your pet was trying to eat you. Why did he stop eating? To save room. Why did he stop doing so much? To save energy. And why did he stretch out next to you all long and skinny? To see how much room you'd take up in his belly. In his belly, baby! No, that's ridiculous. No, that's crazy. I've grown up with Cricket. Why didn't he eat me when I was five? Why now? Why not then? No, no, no. We have an emotional attachment. He licks my tears. I make sure he gets the fattest mice. No, 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 you're wrong. You read those snake books all day, and a veterinarian, a trained doctor, told me this. You know, she wanted to take the snake right away, and I said no. I said you had to say goodbye that this was a family issue. Well, well Cricket is my friend, my best friend, my only true friend, maybe my only friend, or, or a brother, or a father, or something else rare. A family member. Cricket isn't wild like the snakes in those books. He lives here, with us. He's part of our family. No, a snake like this is not your friend. Yeah, he was taken out of the wild, but that doesn't mean he's safe. He wanted to eat you, baby. He wanted to hurt you. Hurt you. I'm trying to be the best mom I can be, okay? I'm trying to protect you. Just let me protect you, okay? Do you want to know what it would be like in the pit of a snake's stomach? It would be dark, and you would be dead. And I don't want to be in this house alone. I need you here with me. I don't want to be here with you. I don't want to hear you complain on the phone about big men and small men and medium men. And I don't want to pretend like I don't listen. I'm trapped here with you and Cricket. And I never put Cricket in his cage because that's cruel. And right here, this is worse than Cricket's cage. With that stupid jungle bedspread you made me get. And all those science books I read at recess alone. Because I'm alone at recess, Mom, yes. And I don't really mind it. At least it's better than those boys grunting on the field all day. You didn't want me to sign you up for soccer. You would have met other kids there. You I don't want to play soccer. I want Cricket. Give me Cricket. Listen, I know what it's like to feel detached. When you're at school, I sit here on the couch, all silent and invisible sometimes. Sometimes I open the fridge and look at Cricket's dead mice. <laughs> they look so peaceful in there, you know? Each in their own little way. I just worry about you, okay? I don't want you to grow up stunted. Oh, so many adult men are stunted. And I know the makings of stunted men. Trust me, I know. Extreme attachment to animals is one sign. Every stunted man likes animals because they can't talk. You can drag them by their pinky toe and they can't scream or call the cops or anything because a pet is your bitch. No, your toy. Wow, no friends is another sign of stuntedness. Having tan soccer boys with lean muscles laugh at you it hardens you and you just stop right there, forever emotionally 14. What else? Magic tricks, cartoons, sucking your thumb. My son is growing up stunted. Yeah, he's not growing. That's the problem. You show your dating app men my snake. You always teeter a bit. You always seem ready to fall down like a cut out doll or something. They see my bedroom, you know? They see me. They look, they don't just stare at the cage. 
It's like showing the dating app on my diary, or my dick, or, or old Christmas photos before Dad went on that Costa Rica trip. <sighs> Cricket is supposed to be mine, and you know that. And you show that toothy smile where all I can do is sit on that stupid jungle bedspread and watch the men watch me. Oh, they look at Cricket all right. They jostle him and poke him and prod him, and Cricket hates it. I know this because Cricket and I, we talk. Not through words, but we have our methods. A nuzzle, a tongue flick, a widening of the eye. The dating at men are skewered in our language. We are very witty, Cricket and I. We talk about Cricket swallowing them whole. We laugh about it. Cricket would never eat me because I am not those men. You talk about those men and spitting out their bones, not my bones, their bones. Baby, I want you to be happy. And I want you to be good, and I want you whole. Not eaten by some ridiculous cobra that your dad bought. Is this all about him? Still? Is this about finding complete closure or whatever stupid headline Cosmo put out this week? Do you just want to get rid of him entirely? Leave it all in Costa Rica again. What's it gonna be? Me? What's it gonna be? The snake and then me? So you can fuck your dating him in peace? Are you serious? No! So this animal was about to eat you! You are the child here and you cannot bully me like this! I'm sick of it! I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. He wanted to stay in Costa Rica, you know? Started up some zip lining attraction, held some exotic pets and pens for photos. Easy money. We're not easy like that. We're not animals, we're people. So, fine. Fine. You win. I am a bad mom and I just want what's best for you. Sorry I'm not a zip lining wife. Sorry I can't corral armadillos for tourists. Some soccer practice friends, a hobby that gets you out of the house. That's all I wanted you to have. So bad, such a waste of time. And I deserve time too, you know? I deserve to be happy too. You get one last night with that stupid fucking snake and then it's gone and we are never talking about it again. And I need an apology from you. I'll get you a hamster or something. You can get out of my room now and leave Cricket by my door. Well, you can feed him the mice from the fridge yourself. Mom leaves bedroom, closes door, and drops snake in front of door. Son opens the door a crack. When this door is closed, my room rustles, grows over itself. First, my jungle bedspread grows vines. The lights darken, turn green. You can see lights behind his bedroom door glow green, and we hear distorted sounds from nature inside. I shrink into my hair, I ball up into a fist. This is to make Cricket feel at home. Of course he's wild. Of course the mice are never enough. I like to dangle myself as an option. I know he'd never bite. When he presses into me, I feel so warm. Like arms are wrapped around me, hugging me, keeping me. So many arms wrapped around and around. Son lovingly lifts the snake out of the cage, wraps it around his torso, and carries it into his bedroom. Closes door on us. A gurgling sound comes from the son's bedroom. At first, just the cage and the snake glow green, and then the color swells to fill the room. We hear sounds of a struggle, but we struggle to see it fully. It's <coughs> blocked a little by the door. We see Mom, slowly drinking in the other room, blank. After a little while of sitting on the couch, she registers what's just happened. It's not that I didn't think it would happen. It's not that I thought it would. I just, sometimes I go blank and I find myself staring at the mice in the fridge, the dead mice, the food mice. She opens the fridge on stage, filled with frozen mice. Look, I didn't even remember to feed the snake its mice last night. They're all still here. I like having those mice here. <laughs> Part of our family. Brothers and sisters laid out next to each other, one compartment away from the lettuce. 
one more night. Of course, one too many. I just tried to be good, and it all became so hard. A gift, sure, a cobra to wrap around a baby. And I stayed past that. And then I used the snake to charm those dating app men. It made me a cool mom, and it sure made my son easier to swallow. They were all so stunted, and I was using a big snake as a reason to stop by. Come see my big snake. <laughs> I got a lot of dirty replies to that, but that's what I was looking for. And I knew the boy was alone in his room, but he had a snake, and I had company, and I was a good mom. Oh, God, I have to cancel my date tonight. No. No, it's too late. And I've already gone on three with him, and he is a real possibility. He's high on the roster. I should go get ready. It's just dinner. We see Mom get dressed in a sexy black dress and put on lipstick. She spends a lot of time fussing over small details, smelling tights in the hamper, spraying her hair with product, smelling her armpit. not coming. He's not coming, is he? I will have to freshen up his room tonight. Oh, I'll have to alert the school that he will not be coming in today. And I will have to tell my men, look at my big Snake, and my son is the one making it big. I mean, full, I mean, floated. And I will have to see those soccer boys come to his casket together, those boys who would never have become friends with him. And oh God, I have to buy a new dress, a nice motherly black dress, not this sexy one. Shit, maybe the sexy one. And I will have to get rid of the stink in the room, in the fridge. I'll have to throw away the mice, the families of mice. The baby mice, the baby sun mice. Hi, my name is Sarah Bagley and I am the author of One Last Try. My inspiration for my piece came from a late night brainstorming session after I was presented with the assignment to write a 10 minute play by my class teacher and sponsor Teresa Scollin. It, I was running a little close to deadline admittedly and after going through about 19 or 20 terrible ideas I decided to run with the one that sounded like the most fun to write which ended up being my base plotline for One Last Try. Since November, it's come a very long way through several rounds of ed editing and peer review, well, with my classmates and my peers, as well as uh, Miss Scollin, all the way to getting to work with my mentor, Thomas Cote, through the Young Playwrights program, which was absolutely incredible. I learned a lot from him, both in how many tiny little ends there are in a play that absolutely need to be tied up before it can be as solid and as good as it can be. All the way to making sure that my characters are saying exactly what I think that they need to be saying to the audience and being able to develop the best character relationships that I can and ensuring that all of this comes across clearly on stage and in my scripts. This opportunity has been crazy and I wouldn't have traded it for the world. I think that being able to work with people like Thomas Cote and the opportunity to see my play be um, produced on stage is still a little mind-boggling but it's been extremely exciting and something that I am very grateful to be a part of. I think that it's amazing that they have a program like this uh, that young people can be a part of and something that is really a once in a lifetime thing. 
think that sharing one's voice uh, in a creative fashion or really however you most often choose to is really important because every single person's take on the world is very special and in using your voice to create things like art, um, photography, writing, dance, music, etc, etc, can help you learn a lot about yourself and discover things that you didn't realize were going on in your life or you didn't realize were very important parts of you until you go and look back on the things that you've created. Thank you and I hope you enjoy. One Last Try, a play by Sarah Bagley. Cast of characters, Scott, a 58-year-old author who's washed up. He's convinced he's still got it. Delia, Scott's wife, 47 and a lot less supportive of Scott now. Lydia, a figment of Scott's imagination, 17, a bit of a dreamer. Evelyn, also made up by Scott, 16, and more of a realist and pessimist. Setting, the living room of a small home. It's cozy with two armchairs and a couch surrounding a coffee table. There's a nice antique desk set downstage and just to the right, a table lamp sits on it alongside a picture frame. A bookshelf sits off to the side. Present day, late evening, around 9 p.m. Scene one. There is no sound but distant classical music coming from the other room. Scott is scribbling away at his desk under the light of a small lamp, grumbling to himself. Delia walks in carrying a book with a bookmark stuck in it towards the middle and sits down in an armchair, beginning to read. I just can't get this right! Oh, I'm sorry, dear. 25 years of writing, and all I can come up with is this! I'm sure it's great, dear. A lousy story about some old guy losing his dog? Yeah, definitely great. Seventh grader could write this. No, no, no. A fourth grader. I used to be so good. You won awards. Pulitzers and Edgars. You're still a great author. I, I promise you. Pulitzers, Edgars, it's all down the drain. God, even the Grammy. Wasted. <laughs> the Grammy? Waste. <laughs> oh, never mind. Whatever you say, dear. A story about an old man losing his dog. God, what happened to me? I was featured by the New York Times. I was doing book signings. I was the star of book clubs everywhere. Delia, the people loved me. I mean, I was no Stephen King, but I was doing all right. I built my life on writing. They loved me, and now I'm just a nobody. I can see it now. One day they're going to take all my books off the shelves like they're nothing. My masterpieces will be forgotten. Everyone will say, oh, Scott P. Grant? Never heard of him. Scott. <laughs> this is the end. No more. Scott, you're overthinking this. Listen, you're a wonderful author. and There's, there's no nothing more to say. I haven't written anything worth publishing in three years. My brain, my talent, it's just up and gone. I think I'm officially washed up. Oh, for the love of God, this again. You know, I'm, I'm almost positive you're wrong. Look, you're, you're, you're talented. There is no doubt about that, all right? Regardless, it's getting late, and I think you need to rest. You know, maybe pack it up for the night, and you can return to it in the morning. You know, sleep will help your brain reset, and, and who knows? Maybe you'll dream up some bestseller by morning, and... Maybe I can finally get some peace and quiet. Dream up a bestseller? You're clueless. A masterpiece can't come from a dream. It takes hours jotting down insignificant ideas, crumpling up thousands of little pieces of paper and trying again. You have to consider the day, the season, the time, the weather. And most of all, the characters. The characters are like your children. Yeah, please. Sure, I'm exhausted. Wait them, but then once they hit the page, you're done. They come more and more to life until they're real and they develop minds of their own. Soon they're the ones making the story. You're just there to tell it. They have lives and jobs and husbands and kids. They own companies and steal cars. They go to high school and that's it. Oh, you and your characters, my word. Oh, I, I love you, but... I'm going to bed. No, stay. I, please, I think I finally got it. Scott, I'm tired. Please, 
You do this every time. You know, if you keep trying to live life through your characters, you're going to lose the life you do have. It's not like that. <laughs> Isn't it, though? No, I'm, tr I'm trying to not, not trying to live through them. For goodness sake, this is just a teenage girl, Delia. Nothing like me. Just listen for one second. <laughs> Always like this. But, but God, you've been so, so wrapped up in your characters these last few months. I, what, I, I never had time for you, Delia? Look, just let me finish this. One last try, all right? After this next book, I'm sure. <laughs> just one more. You know, there's, there's always one more. Wait, didn't you just say I wasn't always like this? You said earlier, I'm like this every time. You're backtracking. God, I knew it. Even my own wife. No, please, slow down. You know, look, you're fine. Everything's fine. Can, can you please just, just come to bed Everything's so twisted up, I can't take this. I can't think straight. Just take a deep breath. Just no, 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 please. Tell me I didn't lose my train of thought. High school. Um, high school girls. Two teenage girls. Yes, it's perfect. Perfect, sure. It's teenage girls, for God's sake. So, we've got girl number one, right? She's, uh, her dad's the CEO of a big company, so they're all super rich, but she absolutely hates him. She dresses outrageously and... She goes to parties all the time. She even gets a boyfriend with a motorcycle just to piss him off. She can't stand the prep school she goes to. She hates all of her friends. But here's the twist, Delia. She dreams about traveling the world and meeting new people. And, and she finds beauty in, in everything uh, from tiny little flowers to the clouds in the sky. Delia gets up to leave slowly, grabbing her book as she rises. We'll uh, call her Lydia. Anyway, Lydia has this best friend, Evelyn, who's the complete opposite. She's soft-spoken, dresses modestly, and seems like the nicest girl you'll ever meet, except she hates everything. She's 100% convinced that the world is going to shit, that we'll all die an untimely death from global warming. Her parents are middle-class citizens, and they tried to raise her to be kind, but have no clue where they went wrong. This is going to be amazing! <laughs> and here we go again. Good night, Scott. Delia exits while Scott continues to talk and gesture, too absorbed in his characters to realize she's gone. Maybe they, like, are there to balance each other out. Anyways, they get thrown together in a group project. And, and uh, wait a minute, they're already friends. They um, decide to rob a bank. <laughs> they're in high school, what am I saying? Uh, Enter Evelyn and Lydia. The, uh, the two girls... Uh, Go to a party. A party sounds quite nice, but then I'd have to deal with people. Ugh. Come on, Evelyn. You do this every freaking time. Let's just go. So what? I just prefer to stay home and read. Book characters can't give me a headache. Hello? Who's there? Scott can't see Evelyn or Lydia. I'm just making it up. I'm sure that's all it is. Please. I'll owe you one. Nope. I think we should go to the movies instead. Eh. Uh, Evie, come here. He's got so many books. Yeah, but they're all old and about psychology. And, ew, this one's about romance. Uh, nobody. There's nobody here. But there are voices. <laughs> I'm just going to go back to writing. The girls go to a party. Uh, there they end up running into a, a famous DJ. I'm so sure I had it this time. Well, you thought wrong, old man. Evelyn sits down nicely on the couch while Lydia rolls over the back of it. Not bad, honestly. Pretty comfy, but nothing like the couch in my room. It's okay, I guess. I do miss hanging out there, though. Hey, do you remember that time we snuck out your window and went to the beach? Where I basically dragged you into the water because you didn't want to get your hair wet. How could I forget? Especially with our trip to the Easy Mart on the way. Easy Mart? A beach? I didn't want to write that. Hello? I already checked him alone. Huh. I guess Dealey was right and finally going crazy. <laughs> Maybe instead of a famous DJ... We end up at a rock and roll concert. Or a nightclub. Uh... None of this would work. These are terrible ideas. Ouch. 
rude. Or at home. All that stuff is loud and annoying. We could always just watch movies at your place. What the hell is going on? Why not your house? I love your parents. I don't know why you hate it when they come in and try and talk to us. They're so nice, and they almost always bring us popcorn and M&Ms. That's only because they annoy me, Lydia. Always talking about how Christ has this big plan. Just wait until the second coming. Yada, yada, yada. It's all bullshit anyway. Have you seen the state of the oceans? We won't be alive for the second coming. All the damage to this planet will kill us first. That's, that's awful. That won't work at all. Then why'd you write us, you dimwit? Scott looks up and sees Evelyn and Lydia for the first time. What's going on? Okay, let's see. You're an old guy from the looks of that photo you're married, and you're writing about a couple of teenage girls. I'd really watch what you say next. She's got a point. No, that's not... I'm just... Spit I, it out, creep. It's not like that. I, I'm just jealous of your youth. I, I, I'm jealous of how carefree you can be, how you can go anywhere and do anything. Oh, poor guy. Yeah, like, I'm supposed to believe that. You wrote about two teen girls for what? For fun? And you just expected us not to notice how weird that was. It's not that weird. I'm not weird. I mean... People do it all the time. I, I swear. Look, I was just trying something new, just, just to remember what being young was like. Aren't you supposed to write what you know or however that goes? Yeah. Do you know any teenage girls other than the ones I bet you dream about? Well, no. But I mean, Dude, not... you just keep making it worse for yourself. Try something new. Huh. You just wanted an excuse to write about all your disgusting fantasies. Ew. That's not... No! I... Please, this is a bad idea. God, make it stop. Make it stop. I didn't mean for this to happen. I didn't ask for them to be real. Maybe if I just... What if he's just telling the truth? If I just did this. Hello? Evelyn? Lydia? <sighs> Thank God they're gone. Delia enters. You were right. You're always right. It's a mess in here. That just be a problem for tomorrow. Tonight has been long enough. Delia switches off the lamp. As they exit, you can hear two pairs of footsteps echo. End of play. <laughs>